Wow. I found this little story this week I thought you'd uh, find humorous. And, and guys, let me warn you, there's a place to laugh and a place not to laugh. Okay, I'll help you out. All right. Uh, it's called The Evolution of Mothers. I'm not sure who the author is, but it talks about how being a parent changes everything and how things change from the first child to the second child and the third child, such as your clothes. With the first baby, you begin wearing maternity clothes as soon as your doctor confirms your pregnancy. With the second baby, you wear your regular clothes for as long as possible. And in the third baby, your maternity clothes are your regular clothes. <laughs> you did good, guys. I didn't want to hear you laugh there. <laughs> uh, preparing for the birth. With the first baby, you practice your breathing religiously. With the second baby, you don't bother practicing because you remember that last time breathing didn't do a thing. And for the third baby, you ask for an epidural in your eighth month. <laughs> oh. uh, worries. With the first baby, at the first sign of distress, a whimper, a frown, you pick up the baby. With the second baby, you pick up the baby when her her ways and wells threaten to wake your firstborn. And then with the third baby, you teach your three-year-old how to rewind the mechanical swing. <laughs> Fess up. How many of you did that? All right. <laughs> That's right. With the pacifier. With the first baby, if the pacifier falls to the, to the floor, you put it away until you go home, you wash and boil it. With the second baby... When the pacifier falls on the floor, you squirt it off with some juice from the baby's bottle. And then with the third baby, you wipe it off on your shirt and you pop it back in. <laughs> uh, you knew it was going to come. Diapers. Yes. With the first baby, you change your baby's diaper every hour whether they need it or not. With the second baby, you change the diaper every two to three hours if needed. And with the third baby... You try to change their diaper before others start to complain about the smell or you see it sagging to their knees. <laughs> oh, the joy of parenting, the blessings of motherhood. I know that when we come to occasions such as Mother's Day there, we come to it with, a, with a, uh, an assortment of emotions. There are those here today that, that uh, the joy and the excitement, the blessing of maybe your mother has joined you in this service with you or... You have the blessings of having a close relationship with your mom even today. But for others here today, there's, their moms are maybe going on to be with the Lord. And you're separated from your mom. So it brings those, those memories of the good times, but the, the pain and sorrow of being separated are, are real just as well. And so there's lots of emotions we bring to an occasion like this at Mother's Day. And I hope and pray the Holy Spirit will diffuse those and we can just take some moments together today as we open God's Word and celebrate the blessings of motherhood in our lives. And not only as we reflect about the blessings of motherhood in our life or the mothers have made in our life, but how that we might be encouraged to be that all God would have us to be as parents and as certainly as mothers and as women of influence as women of influence. And uh, so if you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to look at a message today, a passage that I've entitled, Faith Worth Passing On. Faith Worth Passing On. You know, there's, uh, if you've ever had the blessings or the unfortunate circumstance of moving, you know that when you prepare to move, you'll, you'll go through the collection of, of stuff in your house. And uh, I think that's a nice way of saying stuff. Some things are, are nice and other things, you just kind of assess those as you go through them. You'll look at some things and you'll say, well, we want to keep this as we prepare to move. And other things you'll say, well, how long have we had that? Do we really need that? And you'll discard that. But there are those other items that maybe you'll look at and you'll think, well, this was passed down to me. And I'd love to be able to pass this down to my children. There's some things that you assess are wor worthy of passing on and some things are not. And I think one of the things that maybe we fail to consider in this short period of time we live is that faith is almost the same way. 
Some have a faith that's worth passing on. There was a faith passed on to you. I pray that it was of significance and of value. And I hope and pray that you've been appreciative of that faith, of that knowledge and wisdom and modeling of Christ's likeness in your life by someone, and that you are desiring to continue that, to contribute to that, and pass that on as well. Because of all the things we could pass on to our children, no matter what heirloom it may be, or no matter what uh, antique, or whatever it may be, that one of the greatest things for all eternity that we can pass on to our children, grandchildren, and to others in our life is a faith that's genuine and that honors the Lord. And so today we're going to look at a passage where the Apostle Paul is speaking to a young son in the faith, a spiritual son in the faith, Timothy. And, he's, and the Apostle Paul is nearing the end of his life. He's been in prison and he's appeared already for the preliminary hearing before Nero. And when he was there, no one stood with him to defend him and everyone had abandoned him. But he was okay with that. He even prayed that God would forgive them and grant them grace. But now as he prepares to come, uh, what he knows is going to be his imminent death. That is, he's going to be a sentence to death and he'll never be able to write again. He writes this letter to Timothy. And you might could say it's his last will and testament. Because it's the last words we have of the Apostle Paul. The spiritual giant of the New Testament. And he's going to write to Timothy some very encouraging words and some words that will hopefully strengthen him to continue forth with the gospel. The Apostle Paul is concerned about the advancement of the gospel. He wants to make sure that the message of Jesus is continuing to be declared in the region and around the world. And he speaks to Timothy and he, and he wants to share with him some things that he needs to consider as he considers his faith that would be worth passing on. If you have your Bibles, join me by standing this morning and honor reading God's Word. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we read these words of the Apostle Paul to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. In verse 3, he says, I thank God when I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Father, we thank you today for the reading of your word. We thank you for the blessing today. God, what a great blessing it is to see families gather in this place today to worship. Many with their, with their mothers or just family and friends. God, it's a great joy to be able to share our faith with our family. And I thank you today for the blessings you've given us today. But my heart is also heavy and sensitive to those that may be gathered with us today. And Father, we're thinking about those, whether it be mothers or grandmothers and, or ladies or of influence that, that we're separated from. And I pray that you'd comfort their hearts as well. But, but the end result of today's time of worship, God, that we would be encouraged and strengthened to consider what it means to have a faith, to be thankful for the faith that's worth passing on. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're in the midst of a series of faith. This is our third Sunday. We've been talking about how to be born in the faith, born in the family of God. And, and uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. It comes by faith that we are become a part of the family of God. And last week we talked about how to live out that faith. There must be some things that we put aside in our life, things that are temporal of this world. And, re and recognize that the things that are eternal are the things that are significant and the things that we have an opportunity to participate in. But today I thought it would also be of value that we talk about what is a real faith. 
a faith that's worth passing on. Because my prayer is today that as we consider this message and we consider the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, that we would evaluate our faith. We'd be thankful for the faith that's been passed on to us, but yet also be considered about how that we might contribute to that gift and that how we might strengthen it and then prepare to pass it on to those who would follow after us. I believe if we're to do that, the Apostle Paul says, as he said to Timothy, we must remember your influence in faith. Paul told Timothy, he says, Timothy, if you're going to have a faith worth passing on, you need to remember those who influenced you in the faith. Now he's pointing that out in verse 5. He says, I want you, Timothy, call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded, is in you also. What a wonderful testament to, be, to living a godly life as a mother and a grandmother. Timothy, a great man of God, even though in this passage the Apostle Paul is wanting to encourage him to go forward with boldness, but yet in reality, he was a great man of God. Matter of fact, Paul, when wanting to send someone to a church to minister, he thought and he said these words about Timothy. He says, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. The Apostle Paul said about Timothy, no one is more like me, more like Jesus Christ than that of Timothy. Timothy, what a great, great compliment as Paul is commending Timothy to this church. In Acts chapter 16, verse 2, those who knew Timothy had this to testify. He is well spoken of by the brethren who are in Lystria and Iconium. He had a great testimony. He was a great man of God. And Timothy is being encouraged by Paul to remember how you got there. Timothy, Timothy, don't forget your upbringing. Don't forget who contribute to the faith you have. Because I'm confident that the faith that I first witnessed in your mother and your grandmother is rooted and grounded in you as well. Paul would in essence say, Timothy, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you because of the strong faith of your mother and grandmother. What a great, great compliment. And what a great legacy of faith that Timothy is carrying because of his godly mother and his godly grandmother. Now, how did this happen? How did Lois and how did Eunice, the mother of Timothy, make such a contribution to influence Timothy in this regard? I believe there's two ways that we notice this, and I believe there's two ways that we can influence faith in the life of others. Maybe it's the, your children or grandchildren. Maybe it's as a grandmother, a mother, and these principles apply as well for, for dads and grandfathers as well. They apply for all of us, but certainly they were in the life of Eunice and Lois. Two ways to influence the faith. Com we find the first thing they did was they communicated saving faith. Communicate saving faith. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul noted this about Timothy. And he's writing in the same letter in 2 Timothy in just a little later verses, chapter 3, he says this to, to Timothy. He says, From the childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What a remarkable statement. Paul is telling Timothy that the reason your faith is strong is because your mother and your grandmother continually spoke spiritual things into your life. They were Jewish believers. And so therefore, we know as a Jewish believer, they understood that they were diligently to teach their children and their grandchildren the things of God. The word diligently means to repeat over and over and over and over again. It's the task of the home. I'm so thankful for the institution of the church. We find in Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus came in His ministry, He says unto Peter, I'm going to build a church and the gates of 
Hades, hell will not prevail. But I want to tell you, long before he established the ministry of the church, he established the institution of the home. The home. I'm thankful that here as a church family, we can encourage, teach, instruct, pray, support the things of God, the spiritual things. But I want to tell you, we can never surpass, we can never match, we can never replace the emphasis and the importance of the home in the life of children and grandchildren. It is imperative that parents speak godly things into their children, to speak spiritual things day by day by day by day by night. Every opportunity, speaking, communicating, saving faith. Now, how does this happen? You see, the key to a strong family back then is the same key to a strong family today. It's faithfulness to speak the things of God, the Word of God, every day in our home. I want to encourage you. Because in Timothy's home, the Word of God was poured into his life every day. Day in day out. That was the custom of a faithful Jew. And so Paul is telling Timothy, he says, Timothy, I want you to remember the commitment and the influence your mother and grandmother had in you. They spoke the word of God in your life day in and day out. And they did so with great faithfulness. I'm thankful that children learned the prayer God is good. God is great. Let us thank Him for our food. And we teach our children to pray that way before a meal. But I also, and I love to hear my grandchildren. And there was a day when I heard my children say that prayer. But I want to tell you, I couldn't, there was, there was also a joy when they grew from that elementary prayer to that of articulating of what it is to be in relationship with the Father. And they could thank the Lord in, in sincerity, they could thank the Lord with a genuine expression of worship. You see, we are to teach our children the Word of God. Maybe you have a time in which you pause before each night when you go to bed and you have a family devotion and you allow God's Word to be the center point of your life. And I want to encourage you, if you're not doing that, to consider that. That's the purpose of the day's message, to encourage you to be thankful for the influence of faith in your life, but yet also in other ways to pray that we would be strengthened today and that we would build a faith worth passing on. I remember day in and day out and night in and night out of having family devotions with our children when they were small. And I must tell you, I can't remember not one of those devotions. Not one. But every time, the, if, the Lord, if, if the Lord would give us grace and mercy to do so, we had those devotions. And it was a creative, and I had to learn to be creative, and it was, it was probably never interesting to them, just to be honest with you. But the fact of the matter is, we made it a point of our life. And we somewhat, what I learned to do in, later is to, to make it somewhat of an of a interactive game. And I would say, okay, kids, you open the Bible and you find a passage, and let's see if mom and dad can, can maybe guess where you're reading. And it became a, a lot of fun and, and they would read a passage and we would sit there and we'd get the first guess or the second guess and the third guess. And it kind of encouraged us to be familiar with the Word of God. But yet also it encouraged them to maybe see that their parents loved the Word and knew the Word. And we made it a part of our life and I'd let, allow them to read that. And we'd talk about what that meant to us and we'd pray together. And I can't say that it, it made a, a, an astounding difference in their life. But I do know it was the faith that was passed on. And I wanted to be faithful to pass on a faith of saving faith. A saving faith. Not just bringing them to church, but pouring in the home life the Word of God. And now when our grandchildren come over, what a joy it is to take God's Word out again. And, I'll, and the, the, third year, uh, the third grader, the second and third grader, we'll allow him, he loves to read, so he's creative, we'll allow him to read. Would you read what we're going to talk about tonight? And he'll find a place and he loves to read. And so you have to be creative. But the bottom line is don't stop moms. Don't stop grandparents. Communicate saving faith. Because Paul says, Timothy, you are who you are. Because you had a mom and a grandmother who communicated saving faith in your life day in and day out. Secondly, the way they influence our influence faith is to demonstrate the sincere faith. Not only communicate the faith, 
speak the things of God, but demonstrate a sincere faith. In verse 5, it says, I call to remembrance the genuine faith. It's translated sincere in, in some Bibles. But it's where we get the English word hypocrite. And what Paul is telling Timothy, he says, I want you to remember that your faith was not with hypocrisy. That your mom and your grandmother were not hypocrites. They didn't speak one thing and then live a different way. But instead they were genuine, sincere believers. And their faith was strong. There was an integrity in their faith. Their faith was strong and, it's, and we see that when we, when we begin to look at Scripture. In Acts 16, 1, in your insert, is a passage about where his mother and grandmother came to faith. Or a testimony it says that he came to Derby and Lystria and behold a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. That being Eunice he's talking about. But his father was Greek. And don't miss that. What Paul is, what Paul is saying, that he, that he has a sincere faith, and what Luke is writing in Acts 16, yes, it's, we, we understand that Timothy's mother was a believer, but his father was not. His father was a Greek. Greeks were known for pursuing uh, theory. They were known pursuing eternal truth, but not buying in and following Matter of fact, in one place of Acts, it says that the Greeks spend all their time doing nothing but talking and listening to the latest ideas. Timothy's father was a pagan. He was not a believer. But his mother and grandmother were. And so his mother, Eunice, lived in, a, in what's called an unequal yoke situation. It was a situation where she was a believer, but her husband was not. And I know there may be those of you ladies here today. Maybe that's your circumstance as well. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to live the faith. Because how great it is when a father stands and proclaims the spiritual truth of Jesus as Lord of his life. And it's of great significance. But I want to tell you in the absence of a father who stands and is the spiritual leader in their home. Thank God for those ladies like Eunice and Lois, who stood firm on their faith in their home. They taught the Word of God to Timothy, and they lived a sincere faith without hypocrisy. Not only was, he, was his mom in a, in a difficult marriage, but she lived in a difficult society. Because we know that, that, Lydia, that Lois and Eunice came to faith in the midst of a culture that was anti-Christian. Anti-Christian. It reminds me of our recent trip to India. And there when they brought in some small group leaders, some pastors, for the word of encouragement for a retreat. And there was two young ladies that came to that, that retreat, Indian small group leaders. And they were talking about the persecution that they're enduring in their village. One of them said, please pray. Please pray for my family. And she was, a, she was the spiritual leader in that home. Pray for my family because now, because we have, we have embraced Christianity, they have, they have decided that we can no longer drink the water in the village where we live. We no longer can drink the water. And they say bad things and they persecute and ridicule us. You see, Eunice and Lois lived in such a society where it was not the cool thing or the popular thing. But they continued to be faithful and pray and teach their child, Timothy, the things of God. You see, folks, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you've got a faith worth passing on. And it came because of the influence in your life. And I want you to know that where you're going to go, you need to know where you came from. And you came from a faith, a godly faith, a Christ-like faith. I wonder this morning, can you... Can you think of someone? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to bring to mind someone who is an influence in Christ-likeness in your life? Maybe it was a mom. I'm thankful for my mom and the Christ-like testimony she lived before me. A godly, godly lady. And I'm blessed that my mom is still alive. Man, as we were singing the song, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. I was thinking about Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 when we will all before the throne of God 
worship together. And I was thinking because it's Mother's Day, and both of my grandmothers have gone on to be with the Lord, but I'm blessed that they were godly women as well. I'm so blessed, so blessed. Great godly women, although I didn't know, uh, know them as well as I wanted to. But you know, I really don't know my great-grandmothers. I don't know them at all and beyond that. But you know, I was thinking, we were singing that song, Matt, that I'm going to see Jesus, but I never really thought about that I'm going to meet my great-grandmother. I'm going to meet my great-great-grandmother if they were godly women of faith and they had Christ as their Lord. And what a joy that's going to be. I'm going to be praising and I'm going to meet so many people that passed on of faith down to my grandmother and my mother and my father. Who was it that passed on a faith to you? Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a grandparent. Maybe it was a friend, a neighbor. Why not say thank you, God, for the baton of faith that you passed to me? Because that's how you begin to have a faith worth passing on. Secondly and quickly, not only should you remember your past, those who've influenced you, but Paul tells Timothy, if you're going to have a faith worth passing on, it's not what's been given to you alone, but it's what you're going to do with that. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He says, rekindle the investment in faith. I want you to stir up the embers. Rekindle the investment in faith. Timothy had gotten timid. And Paul is telling him, you need to keep the fire alive. You need to fan the embers of the flame. There's been given you a gift upon your spiritual birth into the family. And you need to recommit, rekindle that passion, that fire for passing on that faith. You see... Timothy had come up on, upon hard times. The church was being persecuted. There was ridicule, embarrassment, criticism, opposition, and abuse. But Paul says, Timothy, remember what was given to you. Now, stir up the passion and you go forward with your faith. I'm so thankful that Jesus, just before he prepares to depart, he looks at his disciples and he says unto his disciples, and he prays for them. And he allows them to know that I'm about to leave. And I'm about to release you. Moms, dads, listen. There comes a time and we need to be thinking about that. You need to be thinking about that. You're going to release those children. You're going to release them out into a world. And it's your prayer. And it's your, it's your desire that they will continue the faith. They'll pass on the faith. How many times have I heard... Parents say, preacher, my children, I brought them to church, I drug them to church, but now they don't go to church. They don't go to church. Let me just say, church is not, I know, I was, I'm, that's my story. That's my story. And that was what I did with my children. But there was something I learned in the process. You can bring them to church and never see Jesus. That's right. But if they see Jesus in the home, it'll make a difference in their life. It'll make a difference. I can't tell you when it'll make a difference, but I know it'll make a difference. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from that. All I know is that when a child's growing up, there's been some, some children that, that uh, come from homes and they're, they're model children. And there's other parents that have children that seem to have some that, that's not so model children. One of my favorite illustrations that I need to tell it quickly is that there was a young couple in my former church. They were so proud because they had two young girls. And they were prepared to write the ultimate book of how to raise model children. They really were. And they really thought that. But I was praying for them because they needed it because then the boy came along. <laughs> then the boy came along and they scratched the book. They're, they, they, they're no longer thinking about a book. You see, you just don't know. You just don't know. There, there's some children that raised in the same home, the same style of parenting, but, and one may turn out one way and one turn out the other. What do you say about that? All I can just say is that we just trust God. We can trust God. And if we'll do what God's called us to do, if we'll live Christ's likeness before them, 
in the home, then it will have a significant impact in their life somewhere along the way. How can you pray for your children? I want to give you four quick ways to pray for your children. It's in your sermon guide. Number one, pray that your children live joyfully. Pray they live joyfully. These are taken from John 17, but there are also some, some references here in your uh, sermon guide. Jesus prayed that his disciples would be filled with joy. You see, I pray that my children and grandchildren, when they come to worship, it will not be a ri ritualistic activity, but it will be a relational passion they experience. Did you catch that? I pray when they come to worship. It's not something I check off. But they'll see that there's a genuine passion in my life, and I pray that it's in their life, that they will live the life filled with joy. There's a difference between joy and happiness. We don't have time to go into that this morning. But may it suffice to say, we pray they live joyfully. Joy comes when we obey the Lord. Pray your children understand what it is a delight to love God, not a duty to love God. Husbands, if you're loving your wife as a duty, you miss, you're missing out on what God intended to be a delight in your life. Now, are you with me? Pray that same relationship with the Lord. Pray secondly, not only they, they live joyfully, but they grow spiritually. Grow spiritually. You want your children to grow in the Lord, but you want them to influence others. You want them to be able to influence their children and their children and their children. But you want them to grow to be more like Christ. Grow in their quality of the fruits of the Spirit, but yet also grow that they'll make a difference in others' lives. Pray that their circle of influence will be used in a spiritual realm. Thirdly, pray that they serve effectively. Pray they serve effectively. Pray that they're part of the family of God, that they're not a part of those who are just watching and observing. I want to tell you, if you've ever played sports, and Denim is a sports community, how many of you just say, I just love my time on the bench? Not me. <laughs> I never liked that. I spent so many hours on the bench. I'm telling you, hour after hour after hour after year after year. Finally, they, got, they felt sorry for me. The kid's not going to go away. Let's let him go in and play a little bit. And boy, it was so fun to get in the game. I'm telling you, there's no greater joy than to serve in the kingdom of God. Get involved. Pray your children are serving the Lord. My prayer for my children is not that they'd come to church. I've made that very clear. I just want you to know my prayer is not that you'll attend church. My prayer is you'll serve the Lord. You'll serve the Lord. Because God's plan in your life is not for your attendance, but for your participation. That's my goal. That's my standard. That's my prayer. Pray they serve effectively. And lastly, pray that they witness or testify continually. Pray that they bear the, the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Mom and dads, I know you're praying for your children and your grandchildren, but instead of just praying, God, I pray that you'd bless them and protect them, this is a great way to pray for your children, isn't it? It's the same way that Jesus prayed for disciples, the same way that Paul was praying for Timothy, the same way I believe that Eunice and Lois prayed for Timothy. I hope and pray today that as a relay of race, a baton is passed on from one runner, one race, racer to the next. I'm thankful for the men and the women who passed on a faith that was worth passing on to me. Thank you, God, for those that passed on that baton of faith that was worth passing on. And I pray that I'm passing on that faith, that you've used it, dear God, you've worked in me to bring integrity, to bring even excellence to that baton. And I'm passing it on to my children and my grandchildren. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, ladies, for being the woman of influence. Thank you for passing on of faith. Would you join me by standing? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. 
we come to a time of our service we call invitation. The music will start in a moment after I pray. But before I pray, I want to invite you to respond by saying yes. Maybe today you need to say yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. You need to be born into the family of faith. Maybe today your yes needs to be to be a part of this church family. Maybe it's need to say, yes, I want to publicly identify with Christ through baptism. Maybe your yes is today, I want to recommit my life. But here's what I pray everyone here will make a commitment to. Everyone will say yes to. Will you make a commitment to say yes to investing in the life of others by praying for them? Praying they'll live joyfully, grow spiritually, serve effectively, and testify continually. You can say yes to that if you so will. Father, we thank you today for your grace and mercy. I pray today, please God, I pray that you would take the baton that's been passed on to First Baptist. God, there's been so many men and women of faith that stood the life of sacrifice and commitment making you Lord of their life. God, thank you for letting us think about those who made a difference in our life today. For our mothers, our grandmothers. Thank you, God. Now, God, I pray that as we thank you for them, that we'd honestly consider how are we passing that baton of faith. A faith worth passing on, we pray for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The altar is open. Won't you say yes today?